You're listening to Archipelago. I'm Josh Mush, and I'm joined by my co-host Derek Blakey. In this episode, and all subsequent, the two of us will engage in a debate over a true or false statement, and our positions will be determined by a coin flip. The debate follows an organic flow that ends when each position has been properly excoriated, and each side will then end with a summarization of the argument given. We thank you for listening. Now on to the show. Today's thesis is, uh, pleasure is the ultimate good. We'll now flip the coin. Uh, Derek will be flipping for himself. If he gets heads, he will be presenting the argument for, uh, in favor of pleasure is the ultimate good. If he gets tails, he will be arguing on behalf uh, of that opposite. And here, ladies and gentlemen, and our friends beyond the binary, here's the flip. And I'm landing on heads today, which means we are, you know, I, Derek Blakey, am arguing in favor of the fact that pleasure is the ultimate good. And as with all, always, the negative goes first. So uh, I will go ahead and argue that pleasure is not the ultimate good. And I I tend to want to to want to lean more towards a sort of like the the Christian angle of it. You know, you look at a lot of Western culture, a lot of it is founded upon a denial of of pleasure and preference of um uh, of higher order thinking, higher order goods. So for example, Christianity, uh, whether you like it or not, is the foundation of of modern Western discourse, and I would say that what makes it such a strong ideology is because of the discipline that it incurs. So there's, I mean, if you go even, you know, Orthodox Christianity, there's restrictions upon diet, you know, not eating meat on Fridays, not eating uh, dairy products on Wednesdays, and then, of course, the prohibitions of sex and masturbation, which... Um, have certainly in 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 sort of modern liberal uh, critiques have said is oppressive, and but if you ask a conservative, they would say um, it's the drifting away of that of the prohibition and the and the uh, suppression of of pleasure is what's led to a current state of decadence and decay. And um, you can see things, you can see states like California and New York, you know, you go there and there's these, these freewheeling hippies, if you, if you will, you know, they're doing drugs, they're having sex, they're engaging all levels of debauchery and, and look at San Francisco and you see human feces lining the streets, you see people robbing stores, you see all manners of so, sort of social dissolution. And to me, it seems that's a pretty good argument for why these prohibitions were in place. You know, you don't you don't look back and well, we won't go to you even go back to ancient Rome before you know Constantine adopted Christianity. Nothing but uh, debauchery and 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 sodomy and and all manner of of uh, let's say decadent acts. And it is through the the prohibition of that there you contrast that with you know the the Holy Roman Empire, and you see mass conquest and you see beautiful architecture, beautiful art, thought provoking philosophy, and you look at all the the sort of splendor that arises from the prohibition of these base desires now to say that it doesn't still exist, you could may perhaps point to the Catholic Church and the pedophilia and so on. So, but again, that kind of goes to the the failure of of adopting the ideals of the of the Christian and um, and Western sort of suppression of pleasure, and that's what I'll open. Well, you know, I do think that a very big misconception, you know, about people like just pursuing pleasure, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't find pleasure in pain or discipline in fact we, we've got an entire word dedicated to it in the english you know lexicon you know and that's you know masochism <laughs> and there is a 
there's a certain level of masochism, you know, with discipline. You know, you you feel good that you put yourself through the pain, that you put yourself through that work, and if you didn't feel any sort of satisfaction or pleasure you know, from enduring these hard tasks, you know, that's why people, you know, climb giant mountains and stuff like that because it's it's difficult and it's rewarding. And if those things didn't provide pleasure, you know, there's uh, there's nothing to motivate the human mind. And that, that's uh, that's the only thing that uh, that matters to the human body is uh, is pleasure and to an extent, you know, the mind. And from the, you know, the very wise words of, you know, one of my professors is, uh, you know, if, you know, <clears throat> the, the body, you know, ultimately just wants to sit around and, uh, eat, sleep and shit. <laughs> and so, um, but your mind doesn't want to do that and your mind will you know, get, it'll get so suffocated in that environment. It'll become depressed if you actually do that. And, and uh, that professor acknowledged that that's what the body wants. Um, but, you know, mindful pleasures are often uh, difficult, hard to attain. And those pleasures are attained through uh, discipline and, you know, through controlling oneself because it's rewarding. And I don't think that you see too many cheery alcoholics, you know, uh, <laughs> for the you know people that indulge way too heavily with certain substances. None of those people are satisfied or happy with their lives. Um, you know, maybe there's a handful of them, but, you know, it's the, uh, you know, if they had disciplined themselves, you know, a little bit more and be a little bit more hardworking, I would say that it would bring them more pleasure than, uh, you know, ju just simply consuming. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you have to stop drinking or anything like that, but you know, I, I'm in, I'm in huge favor of, of indulging in any, any kind of substance that doesn't immediately, you know, harm you and, uh, using it with uh, proper moderation, uh, because, you know, any substance that, you know, can bring you pleasure. I think, uh, it could be fair, fair grounds and moderation. I think that there there should be stipulations to obtaining that sort of things, but you know, um, yeah, I see no reason as to why why people can't enjoy themselves in a responsible manner. And I think that uh, I think that we should have some guardrails up for it, but you know, uh, pleasure is the penultimate good. I would say it's um, it's uh, it's what dominates every facet of our lives. And, you know, what we do, uh, for the people that do CrossFit, they don't do CrossFit just because it fucking sucks to do. They do CrossFit because at the end of the day, you know, they think to themselves, like, Hey, I just did CrossFit and they feel good from that, from that, whether it be the high horse, you know, philosophy or, uh, just that they did something difficult, you know, it's, uh, makes them happy to have done something difficult. And so, it's by that stance that I say that, um, you know, people are, are very confused on the, the sentiment that, uh, that pleasure is the ultimate good. Um, pleasure is obtained through so many ways and pleasure is obtained through pain. Well, I see what you're saying, but even in, even in your defense of pleasure, you, you, you mentioned the alcoholic and the drug addict, you know, for example, you say that you should have guardrails, but that would, in, that would imply that a certain level of oppression or suppression of the will or suppression of the pleasure is desirable. So to me, that seems as though that pleasure itself, pleasure in moderation with suppression is the highest good, but that wouldn't mean that pleasure isn't the highest good because you know, the heroin addict, even though they are pursuing that sort of euphoria, and or even the alcoholic, they're pursuing that euphoria, they are still destroying their bodies, and it is ultimately bad. They feel bad after they do it. But it's still that desire for pleasure is what's driving them. And it is, and I feel in your opening statement there, that... It makes a good case for why there is, a, you know, whether 
you know, like you said, the masochist perhaps d- denies himself all pleasure, but then finds pleasure in the denial of pleasure. Which, I'll come back to that, but it still seems, though, that pursuing pleasure in and of itself, because, you know, the if you're pursuing pleasure wholly, then that means you're not going with guardrails and you're not going with a certain level of temperance to it. You're pursuing pleasure to its full end. And uh, although I think you're saying like that was what people that are against pleasure, that's what they mistake it for. But I think, I don't think it is a mistake. I think that if you are pursuing pleasure, that uh, that the pursuit of it will lead to your destruction. And as far as the masochistic angle... Yes, the the person exercising is an in, or the person exercising the person climbing the mountain, you know, even the you take it literal, the sexual masochist you know, taking pleasure and being denied an orgasm, for example. It's not pleasure in the in the strict sense of achieving some of pursuing something that it, that is enjoyable in and of itself. So I would say that it is a, a, a slight it's a branch off of pleasure because they are deriving a sort of perverse it's a perver it's a perversion of pleasure is what they're enjoying it's not pleasure itself it's a subversion of pleasure that gives them a level of satisfaction so that's where i would i would delineate it as the masochist you know let's just say the masochist has like a sort of a sub you know, put as a category of of enjoyment it, I would say that they're they're not pursuing pleasure, but they're pursuing satisfaction, which I would I would I would draw a line between. I mean, uh, I would have to say that you know I subscribe to the you know ideology that satisfaction equals pleasure, but um you know what what you're saying with uh, the alcoholics and you know and they're they're just t- chasing pleasure you know over and over again, um you know I think. You know, from my personal stance, I know that I find the most satisfaction with moderating uh, any sort of, you know, substance use. Uh, usually limit myself to once a month to, you know, any sort of substance like that because um, that's what brings me the most pleasure. And, you know, and if I limit it to once a month, I feel happy with the fact that I am not handing my entire control or will over to any sort of substance that I can be my own being and, you know, think to myself with, uh, you know, my twisted sense of what I think to be clarity, you know, and, um, you know, I just, uh, I find pleasure in being aware for those other 29 months, uh, 29 days of the month. And for those people that, you know, are, you know, chasing after that heroin high and, um, and things like that. And, you know, they are destroying their lives and they're, but they, you know, are receiving pleasure. And then you you could also, you know, take an angle from a very nihilistic look and, you know, provided, you know, this person doesn't have, you know, people that care about them or, uh, you know, or if they've got no next of kin, and if they're shooting up in the streets, uh, you know, many people say that those those people, you know, don't matter. But you know, you, yeah, who's to say that anyone matters? You know, who would go back and uh, and you know reference? I think one of our earlier episodes, you know, uh, in the vast scheme of things, um, you know, none of it, none of it matters, and. Uh, you know, the best that you can obtain is a name in a textbook. And, you know, or maybe someone builds a statue of you. But, you know, other than that, you know, it's there's not too much further to be obtained um, from a personal life. And so, you know, it's by that basis that I, you know, that I would pursue, you know, what's making you happy. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, these addicts should go, you know, go and shoot up as much as you want. What I would encourage them to do instead is take a step back and, you know, think without these substances, are you happy? And if you are on these substances, are you really happy? 99% of the time, 
even while they're on the substances, they can probably say, like, no, I'm not really happy. I'm just high. And I would say that that's, you know, that's not... That's not true pleasure. I think that, you know, you can be high or drunk and it can enhance pre-existing pleasure. And then that also, you know, le- leans into the fact, another one of my personal rules, you, you never use any sort of substance while you're feeling bad. Uh, for one, it increases your chances of addiction. And two, um, you know, substances that are depressants like alcohol that make you feel a lot shittier if you're sad. So you don't drink when you're sad. You only drink when you're happy because that will amplify that feeling. It'll make you so much happier. And so, you know, because whenever you drink and you're sad, you're not truly happy. You're just you're just fucking drunk. So, um, and, and, you know, it's by, it's by that virtue, I would say, that, you know, the people that are shooting up as an addiction and they're on the streets – that is uh that's a means of escape they're they're chasing escape not pleasure so it seems like to a certain degree you're also equating happiness with pleasure which i'm not sure if that lines up entirely because let's let's take like the orgasm for example when if someone were to masturbate and they you know they reach their orgasm I don't think it's really is. You don't. Nobody. No. I won't speak for women, but I'll, I'll say. I'll say for men. No man has ever masturbated and been like, oh, "Yes, whoo." It's more like a, huh, okay. So it's not. So in the, that's a pursuit of pleasure that you're not necessarily happy about, but you have achieved a sort of relief in the the euphoria of the of the orgasm itself. But I wouldn't say that's. I wouldn't say it's happiness per se. Now and, and so so far as the the you know the drug addict they're not they're not happy but they're high. The drug addict typically is tr- is using the you said escape. They're escaping from the dire conditions in which they live in. So they're, they're rooting. They're looking for escape. They're not looking for happiness. They're looking for a sort of void of emotion. Like if you're doing a sort of hard drug or alcohol, you no know, alcohol being depressant. The idea is that it's a sort of numbing of whatever sensation you're feeling. So if someone has intense anxiety or intense sort of, you know, depression, psychosis, you know, any sort of uh, uh, a level of trauma, they're trying to numb themselves from from uh, from the negative circumstances which they're in. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily happiness. But uh, I'm also kind of picking straws here, like just um, it seems like it's almost like a sort of word game. So I'll kind of just take it further from um, pleasure not equating happiness. I would say also the part of the reason why pleasure isn't the ultimate good is because um, you see sort of any sort of, at least within the capitalist structure, any sort of gains to be made are come from a denial of something or other. So, like, what is a common thing you hear among billionaires? They say, well, you know, I I didn't go out and drink. I didn't go out and get girls. I didn't party. I just, I worked, and I saved money, and I invested, and I grew my business. So if they were pursuing purely pleasure, you know, Bill, if Bill Gates were out there, you know, snorting coke off of strippers' tits and, and you know, getting wasted at the club instead of, like, working solely on his computer and and uh, doing things of that nature he wouldn't have achieved the sort of goals in which he, uh, he wouldn't achieve the status in which he has as you know one of the richest people in the world and uh, same goes for pretty much any sort of highly successful person they would tell you that it comes at a sacrifice of certain th- of of pleasures it would come oftentimes at the relationships marriages often dissolve you know, jeff bezos for example and it's the sort of the the attainment for something higher for be it higher status, be it higher income, higher any sort of elevated position comes at a sacrifice of pleasurable items. Now you could say maybe it's it's the pursuit of it's a further it's a prolongation, so it's you sacrifice early for pleasure in the future. But even as they acquire more statuses and so on, look at Elon Musk for example. He he sleeps in his office like you know he has all these. Whether it's true or not, I'm not going to go into whether it's true, but I'll, I'll say what what's he said at least is that he still lives at a sort of 
denial of pleasure um, in, in even achieving the status in which he's had and maintaining that status requires perpetual sort of delay of gratification. Yeah, I get what you're saying out there. But, you know, once again, I, I have a hard time believing that uh, anyone would do anything that, that truly makes them unhappy. You know, I can speak for myself, you know, as a very, very small-time investor. Um, you know, m- the denial of, you know, spending that money, it makes me really happy to see it in the stock market, to see that, uh, to see that balance, you know, just for one, be present. And two, um, you know, to see the the numbers fluctuate, you know, there's a satisfaction in it. And, you know, further still for these gentlemen that run these multi-billion dollar corporations, I doubt that Elon Musk or Bill Gates would do anything that truly makes them unhappy because they, you know, (laughs) for one, they're making a lot of money. I'm not saying that, you know, money necessarily equals happiness, but it certainly helps. But, um, yeah, you're, you're gonna sit there and be miserable as shit for, for 10 years. Yeah. For something that, that brings you zero, zero to no gratification that I don't, I don't think that the human, that humans are capable of it, much less would the human, would a human even just accept to do that? You know, there, there is, there has to be some satisfaction behind it. And I can only compare myself to those people, I'm not saying that I'm anywhere, you know, on the the level of intellect that those people are, but you know, um, you know, from from my experiences and you know, projecting myself on you know onto them and putting myself in their shoes, I certainly wouldn't be doing anything that I that I found zero pleasure in, even if I was getting paid, you know, an ass ton of money, and if I was getting paid in that much money, I mean, uh, I'd feel pretty great about it. I also think that um you know your uh, speculation that yeah that no one cheers on themselves after they after they orgasm I think that that's a that's a falsity you know I I bl- I have you know that I I blow into a kazoo every time I get there and uh so there's a little bit of a celebration sometimes if I'm feeling fancy I'll do a party popper I imagine you you take a couple poppers every now and then yeah so, so it seems that you you keep going back into the sort of like masochistic argument to where like the these denials of of the denial of pleasure is pleasure itself again i still have to push back on i don't think that's i don't think that it equates to pleasure in the same sense i do think that it is certainly a level of satisfaction and there is certain you could even say that their happiness derives from it. So like you said, with your investments, like you, you get a certain satisfaction seeing your balance grow. And even though you're not using that money to spend on pleasures that, you know, let's say go, you know, ice cream or whatever, and that you, you're not doing like bodily pleasures, but you're you're still having, you're, you're basically drawing a line between higher order and lower order pleasures to where, so even the uh, the subtraction of lower order pleasures gives you higher order pleasure and therefore pleasure is still the ultimate good i just don't th- i just don't think that it is pleasure and I, I just can't i i just can't see that as pleasure itself i can only i can only see it as a a certain level of satisfaction and i i still think there there's a sharp line to be drawn from from happiness and satisfaction to pleasure, and it seems like it's semantic, but I think that it is a, a key sort of uh, a difference between them. Well, I do have, um, you know, one spec- you know, one study that I that or two studies, I suppose, I could reference, um, you know, in favor of my argument. And you know, first we'll take the position that, you know, humans at the end of the day we're animals, and you know we do in a sense very much belong to uh, our flesh and to some capacities you know there's other ways in which we can we can dominate it and and get pleasure from it of course you know we can tell our body no but um you know we could do take the you know take a look at pavlov's dog and you know pavlov's dog isn't going to do anything or you know do any tricks or it's not going to 
salivate from the mouth or produce this desirable action without the prospect or without the positive association of receiving a treat. And, you know, uh, animals, for one, that's the only thing that they care about is pleasure. And I will say that, you know, humans are very obviously not animals. We are a hell of a lot smarter than them. But, you know, we're still made out of flesh, blood, and bones. And so, you know, uh, those things compel us to act in an animalistic fashion sometimes. And then the second study, you know, I'd like to, you know, expound upon humans being a little bit more than animal and about the pursuit of pleasure and subtracting lower order pleasures for higher order pleasures. It starts from a very young age. Um, Humans are capable of understanding this concept. Uh, Many children, uh, when faced with the decision, you know, you can eat one marshmallow now, or you can wait five minutes and we'll give you three marshmallows. And several, several children, even at the, the, these very young ages, I couldn't reference the name of the experiment or the age that these children are, but they will wait for those, uh, for those three marshmallows. And, you know, what, what other excuse would there to be than, you know, I subtract this lower order pleasure. You know, I don't eat this one marshmallow. So that way I can get three because three is definitely more pleasurable than, than one marshmallow. I mean, it's, it's a lot better and it's triple the amount. And so, and so kids understand that animals won't, you, you could do your best to explain to a monkey. He's just not going to give a fuck. He's going to eat that one marshmallow. Is he can't see that far into the future and he, he can't conceptualize it, you know, but human children can, and that's a very, very baseline, um, thing rooted into humanity is being able to invest in the future because we want more pleasure. And those, those three marshmallows, I think is what, at the end of the day, what Elon Musk is chasing, what Bill Gates is chasing just on a much you know larger scale they're they're getting fucking trillions of mushrooms or not mushrooms uh marshmallows and so you know they maybe Elon you know, hanging out with joe rogan maybe it's <laughs> yeah. it mushrooms now yeah maybe it is mushrooms <laughs> but you know they're uh they're definitely you know chasing that just on a much much larger scale and they're playing a much longer wait well, I mean, that, I think that was a pretty good summarization. So I think that can count as your conclusion for this episode. I think you kind of summed up a lot there. Um, and I guess I'll conclude my point with this. I do agree with you that um, the that uh, on the sub subversion, or, the, or I would say I would agree with you with the um, that the higher order nature of us, like there is a duality, there is an animalistic quality to us, but there is also that sort of you know, perhaps call it divine essence that we call our consciousness, if you want to do. Maybe not divine if you're not religious, but um, that sort of higher order of um, of of nature. And with the um, with that, I would say it is that sort of higher nature status that we have is what allows us to conceptualize things as as um, subversion of pleasure and. Um, that sort of nat- that um, perhaps even supernatural quality to see into the future that animals don't, I think, is what gives us that. Um, that's why I just don't think that it is pleasure and that is necessarily what's driving us, or at least not all societies, because of course there's plenty of societies. You know, I'm I'm using the Western example because it's the most dominant and the most. Uh, 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 it's the most dominant and it's the most prevalent and it has shaped the world the most up till now it has shaped the world uh, the most drastically and that foundation still st- still stems from the denial of of the lower order and the l- denial of the immediate now perhaps you still say that is for higher pleasure i still i still say that it is not for higher pleasure but for further gain and satisfaction. Yeah, I, re- I, I would rest my case that it is through Western civilization's denial of bodily pleasure and the denial of of um, of satisfaction 
in the disorder, or I uh, will say the denial, the denial of pleasure in the common sense of satisfying ends. That is what's uh, allowed the Western tradition to be that sort of dominant force and to be that that world shaping quality in which it has. And uh, no, you can you can still if you have anything to conclude with, you can you can finish here. Uh, I do have a. Uh... Yeah, I, d- I definitely acknowledge that fact, you know, like um, the Western world, uh, you know, and their denial of pleasures, uh, you know, there there's an argument to be made that their reservations was what helped them build their empire. But, um, you know, and just uh, one kind of final push for, you know, pleasure being the ultimate, uh, the ultimate good, the, the Greeks pursued all kinds of of pleasures you know of many debaucherous varieties and they are uh they stand as one of the most culturally impactive societies to ever have existed and uh you know even now you know we we cite you know greek philosophers you know um, unless you're stoic or you know those people they they don't they don't believe in in pleasure but you know lots of lots of greeks certainly do yeah, certainly the cynics and the Stoics, of course, which, you know, Stoicism still carries on annoyingly today. I'm not a Stoic by any means. But, uh, yeah, there are certain, there are certain, those traditions do carry on. But, um, well, I guess we'll have to rest the argument there. Uh, this has been Archipelago. I'm Josh Mush. And I am Derek Blakey. And we'll see you on the next episode.